So I'm Anna Dvorak. I'm a speech language pathologist in private practice in Portland, Oregon. And in my practice, I provide individual um, speech and language services to children with autism. And I also provide training and consultation to professionals working with children with autism and train families and caregivers of children with autism on ten techniques they can use. In addition to that, I have conducted research on the efficacy of treatment approaches for children with autism and um, have authored books and chapters of books, one on the continuum of education for children with autism. When we look at um, intervention for children with autism, it should really focus on the intervention you develop should focus on the child's strengths and weaknesses. So what are some of the challenges for children? And as we know, this is quite a heterogeneous population at this point where I know many of the children with, I, with whom I work come in and look very different in terms of some of the skills um, that they have. One common element, though, is always the challenge with social communication and social interaction, so one of the defining characteristics. And again, right now I'm not going over the diagnostic criteria. I know that there's a little bit of controversy right now between some of the changes that may be coming up in the DSM-5, but really just looking at what are the challenges. And when I'm providing treatment, that's what I look at more than the diagnosis is the individual child themselves. So looking at the social communication and social um, interaction, children with autism spectrum disorder often have difficulty with that social emotional reciprocity. And this is really one of the core challenges for them that makes it difficult for them to be a socially communicative, competent um, communicator. So when we're looking at this initiations, and I will be talking about that a bit in this talk, initiations are one of the greatest predictors of outcomes for children with autism, how much they're initiating at the onset of treatment, and one area that you really need to focus on. And that's just the child beginning or starting anything new. And this is important, I will tell um, families when I'm working with them, if the child can't begin or start it, they're what we call dependent on the prompts. And then it doesn't really matter what they can do with me in a clinic if they're dependent on me. In order to be functional, then they would need me to go everywhere <laughs> with them or to have um, the same setting. So initiations is really key, looking at that. And then joint attention. And joint attention is the shared focus between individuals and an object. So being able to, you have initiating joint attention where you use your eye gaze. Say if I'm looking over at the monitor, people would look at the monitor if I was showing the video and then looking back at them to share their reference. So I would be initiating with either the point or eye contact or responding joint attention where um, you would be using responding joint attention if you followed my point or followed my eye gaze. And so looking at those two aspects. Responding joint attention and typical development develops um, earlier sometimes than initiating joint attention. It's kind of commensurate. And then turn taking, of course. So not only the turn taking with toys, but understanding the turn taking with conversation. So the balance turns with activities, with toys, and during conversations. And so these challenges can sometimes make it difficult for children with autism spectrum disorder to develop and maintain these relationships. So when you're planning intervention and choosing techniques, you definitely want to look at what, are, what can we utilize to promote those social communication and social interaction skills. Then children with autism spectrum disorders often have difficulty as well with verbal and nonverbal communication. So with the verbal piece, you might have children who are highly um, verbal, great with concrete language, but don't have the inferential language, the abstract language, or you may have to begin with children that are nonverbal. So there's really a continuum of the verbal language skills. They may be delayed or nonverbal. And then there's often challenges with the nonverbal communication, which is so important. And I think, again, often when I'm starting with families, there's a really strong focus on that verbal, getting that verbal, when really 75% of what we convey, and some people even say up to 90, is through nonverbal means. So if they don't understand the nonverbal communication, they're going to miss out on part of um, the interaction. I think of this boy that I work with, and he was going into kindergarten, so just before five, and I was giving an assessment, the castle, to him. And I was at the paragraph piece, and he was just moving all around in circles, walking around the room, and I thought, I don't think he's going to be able to retain anything. I won't know if it's his skill.
skill or if it's just lack of the attention. And then it comes out his standard scores were 160, 165, so with average being between 85 and 115. And he did, but he had, he was like, why didn't you think I was paying attention? <laughs> and so going through that whole, well, when you're walking around and not looking at somebody, what does it mean? What does your nonverbal language convey? And then how do you interpret others? So you have to think about that both in terms of the understanding and use of the nonverbal um, language. Yeah.